Welcome to Introduction to Logic, Unit 4, Lecture 1, Part 2. In this lecture, you'll expand what you learned in Part 1 and add more simple, valid argument forms to your logical toolbox. You'll use these to verify or prove the validity of ordinary language arguments. This mini-lecture will continue building on what we learned in Unit 3, so if you find yourself struggling with any of the basic concepts as we get started, you probably need to go back and review the previous lectures on symbolizing ordinary language propositions and setting up truth tables. Okay, let's get started. In Part 1 of this unit, we learned four simple valid argument forms using material implication and disjunction. Those were modus ponens, modus tollens, hypothetical syllogism, and disjunctive syllogism. In this lecture, we're going to add another valid argument form using disjunction. We'll call it addition. And introduce three new valid argument forms using conjunction. Your ability to grasp these argument forms is absolutely dependent on understanding the logical implications of these three operators, so if you're still not quite sure about how they work, you should stop and go back right now and review the first two videos on propositional logic. In the last video, we learned how to eliminate an option using the disjunctive syllogism. Since disjunction tells us that at least one of the two options should be true, if we eliminate one of the options, then the other has to be true. The rule of addition, which we're introducing here, works in exactly the opposite way. If I have a proposition which is assumed to be true, for the purpose of demonstrating validity, I could add anything whatsoever to that proposition as long as I use the wedge. So, if I have the proposition, cats have fur, using disjunction, I can add anything I might want or need. In this case, cats have feathers. Because I'm using disjunction, and because I've already assumed that C is true, I can simply add whatever I like. We can quickly prove the validity of this simple argument with a truth table. When the truth table is done, we can see that there are no cases where the premise is true and the conclusion false, and it is therefore valid. The rule of addition is going to be quite handy when demonstrating the validity of ordinary language arguments, as you'll see in the exercises you'll be doing. Our next rule employs the conjunction. We already know the conjunction tells us that two conjoined propositions are each supposed to be true. But what if I have two statements individually asserted within an argument? Since we're already assuming that each one of them is true individually, it must also be the case that they will be true together. And this is exactly what the rule of conjunction shows us. Because I've already asserted C on line 1 and W on line 2, I can validly conclude that they will be true together or conjoined. Though this seems intuitively clear, we of course can use our truth table to prove that our intuition is correct. A quick inspection of each line of the truth table demonstrates that there are no lines where both premises are true and the conclusion false, so we can now add this rule of conjunction to our toolbox of valid argument forms. The rule of simplification is the opposite of the rule of conjunction. If I'm given a conjunction, for example, cats have fur and cats have whiskers, I'm already assuming that both elements of the conjunction are true, which in turn means that they must also be true individually. Now, notice that I'm only concluding one of the conjuncts and not both of them. That's because we're only allowed to perform one step at a time in deduction. If we start combining steps, it becomes all too easy to make a mistake, and that could corrupt our demonstration. Remember, a valid deduction must have an unbroken chain of inference making the outcome of each step in the argument necessary. Also, we are going to adopt an operational rule that we can only simplify the left-hand proposition. 
Well, we can, in fact, validly conclude W on a line by itself using the rule of simplification, we would first have to move it to the left-hand side of the proposition. Now, we'll inter introduce a rule for this in the next section. But for now, just as with the disjunctive syllogism, we're only going to allow simplification of the proposition on the left. As always, we can quickly demonstrate the validity of this simple argument by setting up a truth table. We see that there are no cases where the premise is true and the conclusion is false, so we know that this rule of deductive inference is also going to be valid. Our next inferential rule using conjunction, constructive dilemma, may seem complicated at first, but it's really quite simple. In this syllogism, we begin with the conjunction of two material implications. If Cato is a mammal, then he's warm-blooded, and if Cato is a dog, then he has fur. The conjunction tells us that we're assuming that both material implications are true. If we add, as a second premise, the disjunction, either Cato is a mammal or he's a dog, we are set up to conclude a disjunction of the consequence of the two material implications, that is, Cato's warm-blooded or Cato has fur. Now, let's symbolize the argument to make it a bit more clear. Notice that premise 2 contains the antecedent of both material implications from premise 1 disjuncted together. I don't know whether K or D is true, but I do know that at least one of them must be true. If it turns out to be K, then W will follow. And if it turns out to be D, then F would follow. But since I don't know whether K or D is going to be true, I don't know whether W or F will be true, but I do know that at least one of them will be true. Another way of thinking about this is that constructive dilemma is like performing two modus ponens simultaneously. First, note again the conjunction of the two material implications. In the second premise, we have the disjunction of the antecedent of the two material implications P and R. Because we're affirming the antecedents, we can conclude the consequence. But notice that P and R are disjuncted and not conjuncted. That means we don't know which of them has to be true, and that in turn means we cannot conclude that both Q and S are true, but only that one of them must be true. Hence, our conclusion has to be a disjunction as well. In essence, with constructive dilemma, we're using modus ponens to create a disjunctive conclusion. We're creating a choice. We're building a dilemma. It's a constructive dilemma. Now, once we set up a truth table for constructive dilemma, we'll find that there are, in fact, no cases where the premises are true and, of course, the conclusion is false. Given that there are four simple propositions that make up this constructive dilemma, our truth table is rather lengthy and it takes a while to compute all of the possible truth functions. This, of course, is why we like to use these valid rules of deduction that we have articulated in this section instead of having to perform a truth table for every possible natural language argument. Doing the proofs that we've been learning about is just much faster. So we now have eight valid argument forms that we can use to test ordinary language arguments for their validity instead of having to set up a truth table for each one. Again, the trick is to learn to spot the form of these eight simple arguments, keeping in mind that the universal variables that we're using here may appear much more complex than the actual arguments you analyze. But the form itself never changes. You're looking for the shape or the morphology of the argument. Also, it's essential to remember that the propositions that you need to form the logical inferences may not be in the right order in the argument that you analyze. That's okay, as long as all the pieces are there. 
Think of them like so many Legos, which you can put together or take apart to form the argument you need to arrive at the supposed conclusion. Let's look at a couple of examples to see how this works. Suppose we're given this argument, and we want to verify that the conclusion validly follows from the premises we've been given. First, we need to move the conclusion out of the way to allow us to show the steps from which it might be derived. What we now need to figure out, if we can, is how, using our eight rules of logical inference, we can put the premises together to yield the conclusion A or not T. The next thing to note is what form the conclusion takes. It's a disjunction, and that's a clue. We only have two rules that would allow us to conclude a disjunction, addition or constructive dilemma. In order to use addition, we would need A on a line by itself, which we don't have. Nor is it clear how we could get it on a line by itself. But notice that A and not T are both in the consequent position of material implications in premise 1 and 2. So if we could get them conjoined on a line together, we could perform a constructive dilemma using the third premise. So on line 4, we can use the conjunction rule to connect premises 1 and 2 together. Now we can put lines 4 and 3 together to derive A or not T, which is the conclusion we were attempting to derive. In this case, we only needed to apply two rules to reach the conclusion. Other arguments will require more steps. Let's try another one. First, we want to get the argument ready for demonstration. So we need to move the conclusion out of the way. We're going to move it over to the right of the last premise in the argument. Now we're ready to start the demonstration. First, we look to see where the conclusion is located in the premises, and we find it in premise 1. Clearly, to conclude L by itself, we could perform a disjunctive syllogism. However, since B or L is part of a material implication, we have to get it on a line by itself first. Then we can perform the disjunctive syllogism. But in order to do that, we'd need not J or Y on a line by itself, but we don't have that either. But notice that we can get not J on a line by itself and then add what we need from there. So our first step is going to be to derive not J using the modus tollens rule on lines 2 and 3. Next, we can use the addition rule to create the disjunction. It's not the case that J or Y. Now we're ready to derive B or L from the first premise using modus ponens. Having validly derived B or L on line 6, we can now derive L by itself, performing a disjunctive syllogism on lines 6 and 3. Notice in this example it took us four steps and the application of four different rules of inference, but we were able to prove that L did indeed follow validly from premises 1, 2, and 3. And notice we didn't have to set up a truth table in order to prove the validity of this particular argument. That's why these proofs are so handy. Now, all you need to do is practice with more arguments to get better at recognizing the different ways you can combine our rules of inference to validate ordinary language arguments in propositional logic. It might be useful to create flashcards with each of the different argument forms on one side and its name on the other, so that you get good at recognizing the form as soon as you see it. Remember, it's like playing with Legos. We're putting them together, we're taking them apart to see what we can build with the pieces that we've been given.